So the next algorithm we're going to look at is round robin. And this is the one that's used in Unix and Linux and most systems, a lot of variant of this. So in round robin, each process gets a quantum of CPU time. Um, when the quantum expires, the process is preempted. So uh, in FCFS, the process is not preempted until it finishes. It's not really preempted. It's a form of yielding. But with round robin, preemption is necessary and essential because each process gets a quanta, and when the quanta expires, you have to move the process out and bring another one in. Um, if the current CPU burst finishes before the quantum expires, then the process just blocks for I.O. possibly. Okay. So you have n processes. Uh, the quantum is... Uh, You have n processes, the quantum is q, and each process gets roughly one n time. So it kind of tries to be fair uh, in chunks of q time units. So we look at how large quanta and small quanta affect, how when q is large and q is small, right? How does that affect the system? And essentially, with round robin, you're guaranteed that no process waits for more than n minus 1 q time units in times q time units. Um, the reason is that if you, at the time that you, a, Q, a job arrives at the queue, you have another task, n minus one other tasks waiting in front of you, then uh, each one of them would be scheduled for Q time units, uh, a single quanta, and when n minus one of them are done, then you would definitely have time on the CPU. So at most, you would wait for n minus one times Q. So if you look at the assimilation of this, so let's look at an example. So here we have four tasks, P1, P2, P3, and P4. So here we have P1 and P3, uh, really long tasks, 53 and 68 time units, P4 is 24, and P2 is 8, right? So very dis um, uh, varied uh, requirements. So if you can, essentially, let's assume a time corner of 20. So every 20 seconds, I'm going to switch on to a new process. So P2, for example, needs only one uh, time corner, right? It finishes earlier. And if you look at P1, it requires at least three, uh, two and a half time corner, approximately, right? And so if you look at the average wait time, so I've laid out the scheduling for you here on the top. If you look at the average wait time for P1, um, so the first time P1 runs, um, it's going to be running between, so if you look at P1, the first time it runs is 0, so it doesn't wait at all. The next time it runs is P1 is 68, and it finished, the previous time it ran was 20. So it waited for 68 minus 20, 48 seconds. Then the following time it runs at 112 seconds, so it's 112 minus 68, right? If you total it up, it's 72, and similarly you calculate for the rest. So P2 only waits for 20 seconds. Um, if you look at P3, for example, um, it first starts off at 28, so minus, but when it came in at 0, so its wait time is 28 seconds, at the very least. Uh, then it starts at 88, right, so it's 88 minus 28, another 60 seconds of wait time when someone else is running and P3 is not. And then it starts up again at 125, and so its average wait time is 85, right. So we similarly calculate the average wait time for each of these processes. And so you land up with a grand total um, of 66 and a half. So the average total, average wait time for each of these processes is 66 and a half. If you look at the average response time, similarly, it's 104 and a half. So average response time is you look at when each process uh, started up. So for example, uh, the first process starts up at zero, and then it starts up again at 68, and then again at 112. Um, and so if you look at when each of these finish, so the first one finishes at 125, P2 finishes at 28, P3 finishes at uh, 153, right, and P4 finishes at 112. So 125, 28, 153, 112. So if you look at the average response time, that's 104 and a half. So the big benefits around Robin are it tries to be fair. So it tries to guarantee or it tries to ensure that every process gets the same amount of time on the CPU or 
and it's better for short jobs because short jobs will definitely add a lot. So in P2's case, it's not subject to the uh, order of arrival like FCFS is, right? So P2, for example, gets to run at time 20. Uh, if it had been FCFS and you had a bad schedule, you could have P3, P1, and P4 all running for a P2, which now would experience a very really long response time. And it's fair. The big negatives are obviously you have context switch time at EM for the long as up for the long job. So if you had FCFS system and the long jobs come in, um, there's no cost associated with it, right? So there's no context switch cost. They keep the CPU until they yield or finish up in the end. Uh, in this case, though, you have the cost scheduling kicking in every 20 uh, seconds, or if the job finishes earlier than earlier. And if it does so, then there's, the scheduling cost itself is non-zero, as we discussed earlier. You need to swap in the registers, um, fill out the caches, uh, the address space has to be uh, remapped again. All of that adds a significant cost. So one of the important things is how often are you going to do this? How often is the scheduler going to kick in? And there's a difference between large and small corner. Right? If you have large corner, then you don't have high overhead. If you have small corner, you have very high overhead. But if you have large corner, then the trade-offs in um, what the system's going to behave like. So, so the first thing we look at is what happens if your corner is too big then your performance of the short job suffers, right? So if you have corner that's too big, what's going to happen is that you know, if you have a short job that just happens to come later in the system or is lost in the queue, then it's not really going to get swapped in until all the long jobs finish, right? And when you have the time slice tending to infinity, then it just boils down to FCFS because within the time corner, every other job, is, every job is going to finish and if you have long jobs, then they're just going to monopolize the system. If the time slice is too small, then performance of the long job suffers due to excessive context switch overhead. And the actual um, time choice of time slice in the early Unix system was about a second. Uh, obviously, you, you tune this based on the time of the system. So if, if three users are running, it will take three seconds to echo each stroke, right? Because each stroke itself takes one second because that was your response time. Oh, sorry, that was your corner. In practice, though, typically the time slice today is between 10 to 100 milliseconds. And typical context switch overhead is between 0.1 milliseconds to a millisecond, right? So in some ways, the overhead um, is about uh, 10%. Sorry, it's about 1%. Right? So if you have 0.1 milliseconds um, and you have a 10 millisecond corner.